Good evening and welcome to another Ask Fortel live stream. Uh, it will be an exciting last episode, uh, not only, of course, because it's the Christmas edition, uh, but certainly we have lots of learned tonight uh, about IoT and OT security. Uh, we have experts from our great friends from Outflank, uh, as well as our own people, and we'll have a great giveaway. Uh, Minecraft Dungeons is something we'll give away tonight. So if you have any questions, feel free to ask them uh, here in the YouTube chat, as well, of course, as in uh, on Twitter and other social media with the hashtag AskWortel. Uh, but before we start, uh, let me introduce to you the guests. Uh, and I'll start with uh, Emil Kneterman. Emil, can you introduce yourself? Yes, good evening. Uh, I am uh, legal counsel of Wartel. Um, and I also study uh, an executive master in cybersecurity one day a week. So I am slowly becoming uh, an expert in the art of cybersecurity. Great. Well, good to have you on the show, uh, Emil, for sure. Uh, we also have Gianni Castaldi on uh, the live stream. Gianni. Uh, good evening. I'm Gianni Castaldi. I'm a security engineer at uh, Wartel, also known as Minyaket. And... Uh, I support our customers in their IT and OT environments to make sure that they are safe with the Azure stack. Great. Well, and uh, good to have you on the show as well. Uh, from Outflank, we have Dima van der Wauw. Uh, Dima, great to have you. Can you introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Dima van der Wauw, a red teamer and OT expert at Outflank, based in the Netherlands. My OT journey started during my master's thesis, where I researched the impact of malware in industrial control systems, or OT. Since then, I visited 20 plus production facilities all around the world to assess their cybersecurity using a mix of interviews, configuration reviews, and lots of hacking. Good. Well, that's great to hear and uh, fun that you already visited so much uh, sites around the world. Uh, we also have Nick Sonnefeld on the live stream. Nick. Good evening, everybody. My name is Nick Sonnefeld, Security Business Lead at Wartel, and I am supporting organizations in selecting the right tools and services to provide protection against cyber attacks. Wonderful. And uh, again, good to have you. Uh, we also have uh, Thomas Schrader. Uh, Thomas, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, good evening. Hi, my name is Thomas Schrader. I'm a security consultant at Wartel. And I have a great interest in the human factor of security. Certainly not one of the most unimportant things, the human. Uh, sometimes called the weakest link, but certainly also the strongest link. Um, good to have you uh, as well, Thomas. Uh, and last, but certainly not least, because uh, he'll be taking care of the questions for you tonight, is uh, Maris uh, de Jong. Yes, thank you, Martin. Yeah, I'm Maurice de Jong, and I'm a developer at Hotel. But during this stream, I will seek out the questions uh, so uh, I can hand them over to, uh, to our specialist here in the show. Great. Well, and again, use the hashtag uh, ha hash AskWortel uh, or use the YouTube chat to ask. Uh, while we're talking, we'll, in a, a minute or 10, 15, we'll get back to you on the first questions. Um, but we're going to talk about IoT and OT security. Uh, those are two acronyms. Uh, but what are they exactly for our viewers, Dima? Can you explain what these acronyms, abbreviations are about? Uh, we're not hearing you, Dima. Looks, looks like I was on mute. Yes, yes of course. <laughs> so, while everyone is familiar with IT, informational technology, OT stands for operational technology. It refers to the non-office part of the factory, of, of, of a company. So the, the factory itself, the part that actually produces something or provides a service. And the per purview model is a hierarchical overview of components seen on screen. In layers four and five of the model, you can see the IT zone. So like the, the office environment uh, of a company. And if you go down to levels uh, zero to three, you see the factory side of things. So the OT area. 
So this makes this difference between IT and OT. The process is controlled all the way down at level zero and one. In level zero, you can see actuators, sensors, valves, pumps, and the motors used in to control the physical process. These are controlled by level one, the PLCs, programmable logical controllers. And they can be best compared to maybe Raspberry Pis, a small microcomputer with lots of input and output wires connected to the level below. So PLCs nowadays are connect Ethernet connected and report their readings and outputs to the higher levels, the supervisory systems used to monitor the production. These systems, they, uh, the, you, you can think about a control room, for instance. So uh, supervisioning is mainly the local control and the control room. And as you can see I, in the architecture, IT and OT have become more and more connected to optimize business processes, reform planning and resource management or predictive maintenance. That's why there is a need for a, for a DMZ, for instance, as a security measure. On the other hand, IoT indicates that an internet connected indicates an inter internet connected device that can interact with physical world. So devices that are connected and that have sensors or actuators in them. All right. Well, that's a great overview. Uh, so what you're saying is OT is more or less the factory and all that occurs in it. IT is the regular office environment and uh, a lot of sensors and such uh, in the factory and OT environment. If you look at the security part of it, um, how is that different from a regular IT environment, from a regular office environment? Is there any difference? Yeah, yeah, there is. Uh, the difference already started in the history. Like originally, OT was completely disconnected from IT. This was like tens and tens of years ago. But nowadays, these things are becoming more and more connected. So therefore, uh, factories can face an increased digital risk. Since the con connectivity increase between IT and OT can outpace additional security measures. Also, what is important is different between IT and OT. Like for IT, confidentiality is usually most important, then integrity, and finally availability. Because usually a reboot or downtime is not a big problem at all. This is different for OT. For OT, physical safety of people, processes, and environmental safety is the most important aspect. A very close second is availability as operation and production sh for many sites continue 24 seven. And downtime leads to production losses, which have a direct financial impact. Integrity and confidentiality follow later on the priority list as well. And since, his, uh, since availability is the most important aspect, history has also a pretty big influence because changes are slow to occur. Mm, makes uh, makes total sense. So what you're saying is availability is key uh, for many sites that, of course, have 24-7. Um, makes total sense. Uh, Johnny, let me switch to you. Uh, you are also experienced uh, with OT security, industrial security. Uh, you've worked uh, with large-scale industrial company in the past. What is your experience? Is indeed OT that different? Nowadays, it becomes more the same because uh, well, uh, awareness is increasing, but uh, still the OT environments uh, act a lot slower. Uh, the patching is uh, by nature a lot slower because first uh, in IT, uh, you have a lot of user interaction. And uh, so availability and security uh, always is perceived as more important. While in the OT, by nature, it's, uh, it's supposed to be disconnected, air-gapped. But uh, that was way back, and now you have uh, your PLCs become more connected. So they're running over Ethernet, and administrators want to configure them from the desk instead of from the factory itself. So you have a lot of more attack factors. 
and also uh, the maintenance of OT is usually scheduled when you're having your uh, your big maintenance. So if there needs to be something changed in the plant, uh, if there needs to be something replaced, then systems were patched. But uh, as systems grow more advanced, uh, yeah, you have more patches, uh, so you need more uh, uh, more patch time. And also the thing is uh, in OT in IT. Yeah, you, the biggest risk is spilling your coffee. While in OT, you can uh, spill uh, 300 tons of molten metal. So it, it's a big difference. Yes, uh, that's a that's a great example. Um, and you're saying it's sometimes a bit slower. Also, uh, Dima said because of history uh, in the factory. Uh, what might make it a bit difficult is that you can't always change an OT environment. The manufacturer ships a controller with uh, the device at a factory, and these are not always, or maybe even not often, uh, secured. Um, how do you still take care of a bit of security, and how uh, can you make changes? Can you make any changes? Uh yeah like i said in ot everything goes a bit slower a bit more controlled so if there's uh, some replacement or some uh, new additions then it's planned uh, months before so you can uh, have it in your uh, maintenance plan but uh, as soon as it's uh, placed then uh, things get documented by but if there's an issue of it, or if there's uh, some unexpected seas then there can be made changes and those often aren't documented properly or documented later so it uh, can be an issue so you can do several things uh, to uh, uh, do an asset inventory you can do it actively uh, by scanning the network or that could cause some issues on all the devices and then you can also read the arc and camp tables of your routers and switches which uh, gives you a really good insight in your network, but then uh, it could be that you have several teams or in several plans that have to work together. So that's not always possible. So another way is to passively monitor your network. So you uh, grab a port, span, tap, and mirror from your uh, OT data and read that data so you can see uh, which devices are connecting to which and what is normal behavior, what is abnormal behavior, you can also uh, detect, the, for instance, the firmware level. So if you want to do some maintenance, you can use your passively uh, collected data to see if there are any, uh, any issues or any uh, firmware that needs to be replaced. And nowadays also you can have some, uh, how do you call it, active probing. So that's uh, vendor approved uh, scans that will allow you to enhance your passively connected data to make sure that you're having the most information without disrupting the, the system. Great, yeah, so you're saying there's, there's a couple of options and one of them at least also is the, the passively monitoring as we saw in the, the architecture diagram. Uh, great, Thomas, um, We've talked about OT uh, industrial security so far, uh, but there is a distinction between IoT and OT. What exactly is that distinction? What, what is the difference between those things? So one of the key differentiators in this is uh, OT is often a brownfield environment, meaning that modifications to this area are often costly and they stop the primary process. Uh, like we talked about before, if you make any changes, you have to test them out. And if your entire production process uh, has to go down for that, uh, that will probably cost a lot of money or could result in failure, which uh, yeah, uh, comes into the safety part as well. Uh, IoT is often uh, a greenfield, so it makes it easy to deploy. Its uh, adjustment can be made on the fly without any disruption to the primary process. So that helps. Yeah, no, that's a great example. And I think uh, having a greenfield uh, situation also helps to just uh, do security by default uh, from day one. And like you said, with a brownfield environment, modifications will be hard to do and might disrupt. Um, Nick, you often sit at the table with customers when they are thinking about purchasing security for either IoT or the OT industrial environment. 
Uh, is this indeed a topic for customers? Are they uh, worried about those environments and uh, and what's happening and in, in what what are you seeing? Yeah, so that uh, that really differentiates between uh, business verticals, Martin. As you uh, can imagine, within the education vertical, uh, OT is not relevant because it's not part of the business process. But uh, when we start looking at the uh, the industry vertical, then we can see an increasing demand for OT security. And, uh, and this makes sense when you realize that the impact of a cyber attack on OT can have a tremendous uh, impact on an organization. And we all know the attack that happened in 2017 that took down the primary business process of one of the biggest logistics companies uh, based in the Netherlands. And when we start looking at the figures on the internet, then cyber, cyber attacks related to OT and IoT are more likely to have a bigger impact and can, as an example, result in water not reaching our houses or bridges not opening. Imagine the situation that hackers can get, get in control of. That's terrifying. But those recent attacks on OT makes organizations indeed think about taking measures to prevent them from ending up in the same situation as those companies. And this is exactly what we recognize in discussions with those organizations. And that's good to see, right? Because uh, we really need to spend some, uh, some budget of the IT budget on the OT security. However, uh, what we also see is that organizations still focus on IT security first. And then the next step of that will be to uh, protect the OT security. And that's, uh, that's a pity because it does not receive the required attention yet. And and is it why are you seeing that? Is that are they, is it perceived as complex or? So indeed, it is complex, right? Because usually security comes from within the IT department, and the IT department does not have the knowledge about protecting the OT environment. And OT really is something different than protecting IT, and requires different expertise. Yeah, makes total sense. Yeah. Um, Emil, uh, you are uh, a lawyer and uh, you look at it, I would say, from a slightly different perspective. Um, as we are seeing only limited investments from companies and their OT security, why do you think that is? Why do you think they are uh, not spending the money they potentially should? Well, I uh, I think it's an uh, it's a matter of incentives, or better said, a lack of uh, incentives. Um, I recently did a did a uh, research on uh, why uh, security in IoT devices is actually almost non-existent, um, and it's 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 really a financial thing. Many developers, many manufacturers, they they don't see the reason to invest in it. It cuts down on their profit margins, um, and the main reason for that is also there are there are no market standards. It's it, okay. You design security, but what standards does it need to uh, need to meet? There is no unified uh, code of standards that that can say okay, um, this this is what IoT or OT security needs to to match to be to be compliant. So it just completely doesn't exist. Uh, another issue, which is more legal issue, um, is one of uh, product liability, and especially in the Netherlands. Um, product liability has not has totally not yet been adapted to to um, security by design. So that means that if you um, provide a product which is otherwise working properly, but you don't think about the security, um, arguing product liability is a thing because uh, our um, our go our government, our parliament, they have they haven't thought about it yet because the market goes so fast, yeah. and usually the legal processes they 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 tend to be at least a decade behind it. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, something we see. So what you're saying is governments lag behind. Is is there any concrete legislation at this point for uh, for anything around OT security? As far as I'm uh, aware, there is nothing being worked on, neither for OT or IoT. But it's a lot of uh, a lot of uh, focus groups, a lot of interest groups. They are like saying, okay, maybe as a market we should should uh, start organizing ourselves. Um, and create standards and just start enforcing things, uh, yeah, voluntarily. Yeah, the market should move ahead and uh, and get things sorted. Yeah, makes sense. Yeah, and eventually um, the government will follow. Yeah, true. 
Uh, Maurice, uh, we're 20 minutes into the session. Are you seeing any questions on social media? Yes, yes. Uh, but first, I want to uh, mention uh, to our viewers that uh, to encourage everyone to uh, take part of our conversation, uh, we again have a very nice prize uh, to win this time. Um, as always, at the end of the show, we will pick one of our questions as our winner. And uh, today, that will be the winner of Minecraft Dungeons. So uh, that's uh, the first part that I wanted to mention. Uh, then uh, there's a question. Um, uh, the question is, uh, are there any practical differences between uh, IT and OT uh, that can lead to security uh, security risks? Uh, so, yeah, like, like I think uh, normally you think about uh, there is an office and people can, uh, can misuse uh, things, but um, I was thinking, well, this is a bit different. This is OT. So, yeah. So, what you're saying is any practical differences between IO, uh, IT and OT that can lead to security risk? Uh, mm -hmm. Dima, is that something you can comment on? Uh... Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, misusing things. Uh, operators like, mm, I, like OT. Uh, OT operates 24 seven and oftentimes operators take shifts supervising the process control. Like during the night shift, there is less activity and no action is required as long as the process keeps running with correct readings. Um, yeah, this could be boring for operators just supervising the night shift and could lead to things such as internet use for past time experiences like uh, undocumented ethernet cables Chromecasts, Wi-Fi dongles, so basically subverting firewalls and well, creating some pastime experience. I think this is an uh, interesting human influence on the interplay of IT and OT. Yeah, a great example. We can all relate to that, that uh, if you're doing a 24-7 ship, the dark hours yeah. might be uh, hard to come by and, uh, and and they're trying to kill time and, and like you said, subverting things that uh, they potentially shouldn't. Uh, good good example for sure. Um, any other questions, Maurice, uh, for now? Yeah, yeah. There's another question from uh, YouTube. It's uh, Lars from Blitterswijk and he asks, uh, do I need to run a device uh, for uh, in your network for uh, for using uh, CyberX or Azure Defender for IT IoT, so yeah, he uh, he knows a bit about uh, OT, I guess. Yeah, great uh, question as well, uh, Johnny. Do we need a device somewhere in the OT environment to uh, to get any monitoring? Johnny, you're on mute, I guess. Yeah, I was on mute, sorry about that. So uh, what it is uh, for uh, CyberX and uh, products like CyberX, uh, you need a, a, a sensor and on the sensor you can receive uh, traffic in uh, spam, tap, mirror ports, uh, or you can uh, also use a, uh, from your network device, or you can also use a, uh, an inline tap and, and that way you don't have to uh, create extra load on your uh, network devices. Yeah, so what you're saying is a sensor in your OT network, um, and this could be an appliance or maybe something virtual that uh, can then start listening. Yes, and also preferably at least between uh, the Purdue layer one and two so that you can uh, distinct your, your actual OT and a bit of your operating uh, so it's between the process control and the supervisory layer. Yeah, great reference to the Purdue uh, layer for sure. Um, Maurice, any other questions you're seeing coming in at this point? Yeah, uh, the, the, it came in just uh, j just this minute. Uh, it's from Puraf. Any thoughts on Tenable OT? And we're seeing it in. Uh, in the screen. Anybody want to comment on this? I'm not sure what uh, Puraf is meaning by tenable. Yeah, so I can comment on that one. Because uh, about, uh, I guess, uh, back in 2018, uh, tenable, uh, of course, known from the NASA scanner, 
uh, started uh, creating also a sort of same uh, project. And what they did is they uh, create, uh, they first started with Siemens. And uh, back then that was their main focus while uh, CyberX is more focused on plants. Uh, but uh, yeah, Tenable is a, a good product also. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, we'll come uh, we'll come to how uh, how CyberX Azure Defender will uh, uh, will work um, because Microsoft recently acquired CyberX um, and is going to make it available under that name Azure Defender for IoT. Um, can you tell us a bit more about that uh, journey? Uh, definitely. So uh, CyberX is, uh, was founded back in two thousand thirteen. And uh, they started with uh, two uh, separate companies into uh, securing their network and uh, making sure that all the threats that can be started, uh, at least monitored with CyberX tools, uh, were available for those uh, companies. And then back in 2017, 2018, uh, we also first seen them in the Netherlands and they make uh, impressive growth in their uh, product, in the company, in the detections. And that's also the reason why they have been acquired uh, this year. And uh, yeah, so like I said, uh, one of the ways uh, to uh, properly uh, monitor your OT environment is by using passive scanning. And that's what uh, CyberX does. And it also has the 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 extra uh, probing uh, which is approved by the vendors of the plc devices so you can uh, get more data from your plcs and great so again, um is there something you can show is there uh, could you show us uh, the first looks of azure defender for iot definitely let's see uh, here it is I'm signing into the portal. So what I've done, I'm currently uh, running uh, this sensor on uh, my own laptop. And with that, I can uh, detect uh, things and I can also read recaps, of course. So uh, what you see over here are above are the alerts. Uh, these are the, the packets the sensor sees and uh, the alerts it's seen. And you have a great uh, timeline of the device uh, what it already has seen and also of course the alerts and the thing i like most is because for uh, proper monitoring you need an asset map so you need to know what are your devices uh, where are they connected to uh, also uh, you have a great view and uh, what's uh, for instance this is a uh, rockwell plc it has, the, of course, the communication module, and then you have the, this one has four plots in use. And you can also, uh, for instance, see uh, what's its, uh, well, what, what what is it connecting. So you can see the 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 IOs, the the remote IOs, to all the devices it's connecting to the control logics card. So it's a really expanded view about uh, what's connecting with what. And also you can see the, the whole Purdue model. Of course, you have the, the enterprise part, you have the supervisory part, you have the process control part. And over here you can see uh, which device is connecting to which PLC. And if you zoom in more, you can see all the details uh, on which devices you've seen alerts. Uh, so you can expand also that. And then in the alerts, you can see uh, you can see. For instance, this is a great a overview. Timeline. Uh... Yeah, definitely, it's uh, it's giving a great overview. And you can see the if someone uploads a, a PLC program, which is also nice to know because. Uh, like Dima said before, uh, adversaries can use uh, the technology to uh, also cause harm. Yeah, so uh, timeline also, of events. Yeah. And you have also the, 
for instance, what's also a good thing to know is the, the firmware version. So, you know, these are quite up to date. And then you can also plan your maintenance to see, hey, this is version 16. Maybe it should be 18 or 19. So uh, those are uh, cool things you can do. And also you can create custom alerts. Uh, for instance, in our demo environment, I created the PLC stopped or when someone requests a download or if uh, someone does something with the security, then you can uh, trigger alerts on it. And the good fun thing of it is if we look in the timeline, then you can also see like the, the PCAPs related uh, to the alert. So yeah, it's wonderful. Um, that's the one I was looking for. Over here we have the custom rule. And then you can see the PCAP and you can see uh, which assets it's was from and to. So, uh, well, Cybers gives you a really nice overview in, uh, into your network, into your OT state, and also you can uh, detect uh, attacks. So that's uh, it's really nice. You can also have your alerts, you can pin alerts, you have your recent alerts. So it's a really extensive monitoring tool. Great. It's wonderful to see that you can also build your own uh, alerts and extend some of these use cases into uh, into Azure Defender for IoT. Definitely, yeah. and you can also uh, target your al alerts based on IP addresses. So if you know that uh, operators are supposed to work from their own IP range, then uh, if someone else tries to program your uh, PLCs or your controllers, then you can also get alerts from those without uh, causing any false positives. Yeah, making sure you apply the context to uh, to the alerts. Yeah. yeah, great. Well, thank you uh, for now, uh, Maurice. Um, did any more questions come in? Uh, as as you can see, I have a technical problem with my uh, with my screen. But uh, yeah, there we can still questions. hear you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I will fix that. Um, what are the risks uh, of extra monitoring infrastructure in the OT and IoT environment? It's uh, you can send it in, you. Yeah, that's a valid uh, question. Uh, Dima, are there any risks if you start monitoring your OT environment? Is that any harm to your network? It depends a bit, but uh, it, I, I think it could be fairly safe, especially if you're monitoring on a span port of your network then and, and create dedicated infrastructure segments that are filtered away from the rest of the network i think it could be uh, implemented fairly safely for the process as well as securely against cyber risks mm, good point yeah the passive monitoring of course is what the word says uh, non-intrusive uh, and if i saw and we all saw on johnny's demo uh, that you get a, a ton of information already then uh, then that is certainly a way to go that is not disrupting any of those critical environments um maurice any other questions at this point yes yes there's another question from uh, franz Vogt. he he asks uh, any fine examples lists of ot breaches demonstrating the real threat do we have uh, anything like that? Yeah, um, I think, and that's a great uh, jump to uh, to the next question. Uh, let, let's talk at uh, at some of these actor groups or attacks or examples we're seeing in the wild. Uh, Dima, uh, we've been talking about security for OT and IoT in a general sense, but uh, indeed, like Franz asking, uh, does it happen in real life? Are there any attacks on OT? We can, of course, all relate to Stuxnet, but that seems to be the work of governments. Uh, are there any actors active on OT? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Uh, for instance, uh, easier attacks, they can more generally like target availability of the workstations themselves. So like target availability windows using, for instance, ransomware. The more interesting and more complicated examples they usually target the integrity of the process that is being controlled and of that there is also various but of course less examples one of the more recent ones is triton 
And this is a this is a quite an advanced malware, like a very skilled threat actor used the Triton malware to target OT environments. So the actor was able to infect a machine at the target company and used used it to obtain like and and obtain foothold basically in the in the IT IT landscape of the of the business. From there, it uh, performed lateral movement to OT. For instance, with Mimikat, which was also used like credential harvesting. Once the actor reached OT, they took their time, like almost a year to prepare their attack, which consisted, well, for the, the impact parts, it consists of two parts. So first, the attacker disabled the safety PLCs and safety PLCs are programmed to ensure that um, that the physical process would never cause any unsafe condition, like or physical harm, basically. So that's the the main goal of the safety PLCs. And once the safety PLCs were disabled, the actor was able to physically harm the process being under control. Like a simplified version of the attack is shown here. Yeah. So the attacker moved from the internet to IT, potentially using phishing. From IT, the attacker moved laterally uh, using credential harvesting and possibly other techniques into the OT environment. And once re reaching in the uh, reached in the OT environment, the attacker started communicating with safety PLCs to disable them and then with PLCs to cause physical damage. Um, to, to cause physical damage, uh, the attacker basically sent commands, commands to the PLC. And most of these uh, process control communication is unencrypted. We have a, like a PCAP from that. Yeah. So on the screen, you, we have a PCAP or like a print screen, screen of a network capture. And in a network capture print screen, you can see that uh, there is a communication between a control station and a controller. And you see all kinds of parameters. This communication is not encrypted and doesn't have any integrity, like control apart from a CRC 16. And you can perform commands. Like in the middle of the screen, you can see that a certain command is being performed and the response to that, and you can change the state of the PLC, for instance, from running to stop, or you can write into registers, you can read into registers, uh, all kinds of things. So yeah. furthermore, I'd like to highlight two interesting differences between, between this attack, basically between IT and OT attacks. Um, the first one being lateral movement, Triton used, for instance, Mimikatz for credential harvesting to obtain passwords and hashes from memory. Uh, this already is a problem in IT, but it's even worse in OT. Um, because Mimikatz, for instance, obtains these credentials from memory that are present since the startup of the operating system. So all the credential material, for instance, these hashes are obtained since the computer or Windows was booted up, which in OT might be like a year, maybe. Like some systems have, have uptime of like hundreds of days, years even. And over time, the more people log into them, uh, over time, they slowly are becoming more and more a complete copy of the entire domain. And then, compromise of one OT machine could provide an attacker with a near copy of the domain controller. And that's pretty sweet. It really speeds up uh, the credential harvesting part. Wow. Um, another part uh, is, is basically that I want to highlight is uh, the safety systems, like especially safety PLCs. Like the sole functions of uh, sole function of these safety PLCs are there to keep the process in a safe state and to perform an em emergency shutdown if uh, an unsafe state, like a critical state, is reached. So 
Therefore, best practices dictate that safety PLCs should not be connected to any OT network. And this is also something that I believe also went wrong and something that could uh, allow an attacker to cause integrity damage onto the process. Yeah, makes uh, makes a lot of sense. That is a great story, Dima. That's uh, that's a lot of detail and uh, something that's from the real world happening to uh, uh, to an industrial system with an attack uh, uh, from Triton. Um, you you hi you you touched on a on a fairly important point, I would say, because that means that I need to plan and put a lot of thinking into the design uh, of OT environment. So, um, is that or is that why is it monitoring important? Yeah, so monitoring is an interesting thing for uh, for OT especially. So a lot of plans were commissioned a long, long time ago, like tens of years ago, when the design of security mechanisms wasn't that present yet. So it isn't always possible to prevent an attack and a, a successful attack. Therefore, it is important to be able to detect and respond to threats. So imagine there is a large multinational with many factories all around the world in interconnected by a virtual internal network. Like preventing the compromise of a single machine would be difficult. Furthermore, since changes oftentimes can impact availability, it is easier to add something. So to add monitoring. Uh, furthermore, uh, slowly changing environments like OT environments are especially suited for something like monitoring because they're quite statically and you have more opportunity to do anom anomaly detection. And the last interesting concept here is that attackers generally need some knowledge of the targeted network or process to impact it. And learning takes time and learning about the OT environment and network like takes time and enumeration, which can then be used by blue teams to detect anomalies. Like for example, Triton was in for almost a year. This, this could give blue teams a lot of time to detect anomalies. Yeah, very, very true point. And a year, that's a long time for sure. Yeah, they've, uh, they've took their time. Um, Maurice, um, how is social media? Yeah, we got a lot of questions. Um, this one is from uh, Lars van Blitterswijk. Um, he asks, uh, is threat hunting also uh, relevant for OT environments? And uh, if yes, how do you approach this? And what are you, what are you looking for? Yeah, so the question is, uh, do we do any threat hunting in OT environments? Is it uh, applicable like it is in, for instance, IT environments? Uh, anybody want to comment on that? Johnny, is, uh, is that something you saw at, uh, at, uh, at the site you worked with? Uh, is threat hunting relevant in, in OT as well? Do you do investigations and, and deep dives? Yes, well, it's, uh, I would say it's a bit more uh, like vulnerability assessments. So usually you take your configuration, you audit it, look uh, uh, at ACLs and which devices can to talk to which. So uh, it's more uh, auditing than threat hunting. But uh, threat hunting is also it's a good uh, thing or if you use a solution that can uh, passively monitor your network, then you're always threat hunting. Yeah, you're using those signals in your use cases to uh, to investigate and, uh, like Dima said, find anomalies and uh, and do uh, do some hunting that way. Okay, yeah, fair point. Um, Maurice, uh, I see your uh, camera is giving you a hard time at this point, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> we can we can now see you and hear you again. Any more questions? Yeah, yeah, I've got another one from uh, Pura. Um, how does it uh, discover device? I think this is uh, this is about uh, the CyberX or Defender. Uh, uh, is it agentless? So does it reach back to the sensor or uh, the platform? 
Yeah, and this yes. is something I think uh, we touched on earlier, right? The passive uh, monitoring from the span port and getting information from traffic on the OT network. Yes, so uh, you're, that's a good way to monitor and also uh, the, the, the vulnerabilities you can also detect by uh, relating to the, the firmware version because uh, if, there, if Rockwell, for instance, finds uh, an issue, a CV, then they will fix it in the next uh, firmware release. So if you monitor the firmware releases, then you know at a certain level you don't have the, the CVs or the vulnerabilities. Yeah, basic asset management and vulnerable threat and vulnerability management combined. Yeah, great point. Um, Maurice, anything more? Yes, the webcam is still working, so that's great. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, there's another question. Uh, it's from Koos Gosens. Uh, okay. He saw uh, Mark Rusinovich uh, announce uh, Azure Sphere a while back at Ignite. Um, well, you can see it. How does this device fit into Azure Defender? That's about oh, yeah, Azure Sphere. Sphere. We've, uh, we've uh, heard about that before. Uh, Thomas, is that something you want to comment on? So slightly, yeah, sure. Um, I think one of the main differences between those two products is a that uh, Azure Defender for IoT comes from uh, is part of the CyberX solutions and it's providing the agentless uh, part for monitoring the environment. And when we're talking about the specific use case for Azure Sphere, we're talking about uh, taking an IoT device and ensuring the safety of that device, ensuring the uh, update cycles of that device. So it, it's, uh, now we're seeing a picture right here. Uh, it's the hardware that matches with the other device, uh, the IoT device, to ensure that the device stays safe and it's an uh, integral part of it. Yeah. And, and what you're saying is with Azure Sphere, you're adding a device to your uh, chain, uh, making sure its uh, data and such as integri integrity is, cons is uh, conserved. Yeah, so that uh, if any changes are made, yeah. that, that uh, internal handshake is gone and uh, the integrity is lost, and then you know that you have to act. Yeah, so what we're mainly seeing is the Azure Sphere uh, probably also apply to IoT environments instead of OT environments. Correct. Yeah, good. Good Good questions tonight. Uh, Maurice, anything more on your queue? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> There's another one. <laughs> this Great. one is uh, from uh, Purav. Uh, I will send it right away so uh, we can display it. Uh, can you get alerts notified of code revisions for controllers? For example, unauthorized firmware changes, etc. Oh, great question. I'm I'm going to Johnny yeah. for this because this is something you could build a use case for or no. Definitely there are, of course, you have the default alerts, but you also, I think, almost all the components that you can communicate or interact or write with, all those are uh, available in custom uh, rules. So you can, for instance, create a detection if someone writes firmware or if someone uploads a new program. Those are all events you can monitor on. And then, of course, you can uh, forward them to your uh, Azure IoT or your favorite scene or uh, yeah, wherever you want to go. Yeah, and, uh, and start extending the business cases and use cases there. Yeah, valid point. Um, let me first go back to Emil, and we'll take a round of questions in a couple of minutes. Uh, everybody wants to win the Minecraft Dungeons, I guess, so good work. Uh, hashtag Ask Wartel on social media or in the YouTube chat. Uh, go ahead and ask us. We'll be back in a couple of minutes with more questions. Emil, um, these kinds of attacks, uh, what can we do with them? Uh, it's not a matter of uh, sending back uh, a letter to uh, the actor uh, saying, could you please stop this? Uh, do we need to involve the right authorities? Uh, what about disclosure? Any rules or, or something you could comment on? Yeah, this is this is really a, a very hard uh, topic because, uh, yeah, sending out a simple cease and desist letter to, uh, to say it in legal terms, who are you going to send it to? Because it's a matter of attribution. You you get attacked, and quite often you don't know who they are. Um, and if you do know who they are, they are most likely in another jurisdiction. 
so they are not in your local jurisdiction. So that means if you go to the police to, to, to file, like, I've been attacked, uh, you file criminal charges, then, that, uh, uh, then the, the Ministry of Justice needs to do uh, a, a legal, uh, a legal uh, request for aid to the jurisdiction in which the, the attackers are. Um, but, and, and then it's up to the jurisdiction if they, if they want to pursue these attackers. And there are some jurisdictions in which the authorities will do absolutely nothing. Like, for instance, yeah. if you have Russia or, and China, it's, it's, it's useless to, 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 to go after them. Um, even I would say even worse, uh, in Russia and China, quite often these groups are being encouraged and they're actually quite often uh, state-sponsored actors because they, they are serving the interests of, of the state. So in that sense, they are not going to pursue criminal charges against people that are actually working for them, um, although they would deny it. So it's, it's, a very, it's a very hard situation. How do you deal in legal terms with these attackers when you cannot find them? And if you can find them, uh, they are in a jurisdiction that, that, that you cannot do anything about it. So it's a very hard question. Yeah, that uh, attribution is uh, is always very very hard. Valid uh, yeah. valid points. Yeah, who's behind the attack and how do you uh, reach back to them? Um, Thomas, uh, many of the security solutions uh, we see from Microsoft are now called uh, Defender. Uh, could you shed some light uh, in the darkness? How does that all work? So, so uh, we've talked about Azure Defender IoT before, and uh, most of the Defender solutions are fixed on the IT part. So uh, when we're talking about the Defender, uh, Microsoft 365 Defender Suite, we're talking about Defender for Identity, Defender for Endpoint, Cloud App Security, and Defender for Office 365. Uh, most of these provide, uh, were formerly called Advanced Threat Protection, uh, and most of them are now called Defender. So what you can see is that there's a shift in the marketing term that they're using. Hey, they used to be called ATP, now it's being called Defender. Uh, I, I give no promises that any changes will be made <laughs> in the near future for any new Defender products, uh, but it seems to be a marketing effort uh, to consolidate and to make it a bit easier for outsiders to understand the product lineup. Yeah, well, and we've seen for customers that these are things that uh, that make a lot of sense. Uh, they didn't change the products themselves, but they aligned them, I would say, and then wrapping them into a Microsoft 365 bundle altogether. Um, yeah. Talking about bundles, uh, Nick, uh, does that mean that the customer has to buy everything from Microsoft now and that an E5 license is the way to go? No, let me start with uh, answering that question, Martin. That obviously is uh, not the case. There is no golden solution, right, for protection against cyber attack. But what we can conclude is that integration of security solutions is key to fight hackers within your IT and OT environment, because nobody eventually wants to end up with blind spots. Now, when we start looking at the OT environment, we can conclude that more than 50% of the attacks are originating from the IT environment. And this is, as Dima already mentioned before, because more often the OT environments are linked to the IT environments and this increases the attack surface and hackers will find their way in. Well, this is just one example why you should not focus on just protecting the IT or only the OT environment, but to protect both worlds, uh, an integrated IT OT approach for cybersecurity is required. And exactly this is uh, what makes Microsoft a strong player in both OT and IT. Yeah. Yeah, total uh, makes total sense. Uh, and all of these uh, cybersecurity solutions that Microsoft uh, brings to the market at, that have strong points at uh, each of the, the aspects. Uh, Johnny, um, last year Microsoft launched Azure Sentinel. Uh, we've seen a lot of data sources that help you build those use cases. Um, will Microsoft Defender for IoT also be able to connect to Azure Sentinel? Can you can you talk about that? Yes, definitely. They're working uh, on the integration uh, to send all the alerts uh, from uh, the, uh, the sensor uh, to the Azure IoT Hub. And from the Azure IoT Hub, you can grab the alerts to uh, put them in, uh, for instance, our favorite team, Azure Sentinel. And then you can uh, build like use cases around alerts, but you can also use the sort capabilities, for instance, to 
if an alert in a certain uh, VLAN happens, then maybe you want to uh, have your firewall to block uh, certain connections or maybe separate the, the, the supervisory and uh, process control part so you don't have any spreading because in the end, if you have an issue in a process control part or in your I.O. parts, then you don't want to block everything because then you will stop the production and harm the business. Yeah, makes uh, sense. Can, do you have uh, something you could share, a live demo perhaps with uh, yes. uh, Azure Defender IoT and Azure Sentinel? Yes, uh, we can do that. Bear with me for a moment. So over here we have the, the Azure IoT Hub. And Azure IoT Hub uh, receives all the alerts. So from the alert pane down here, you have the overview. And in the overview, you get to see all the alerts and maybe security recommendations, uh, devices with the most alerts. That Those are, are uh, the, the sensors at the moment. And if we go to the alerts, then you can see the alerts we have in our testing environment. So what we did, we did uh, set up a small uh, small PLC part, and we did some scanning. Uh, like before, Tenable, the, they also have the, the message scanner. So we run a nest scan on our network, and then we triggered the, the not patch alert, for instance. And uh, those alerts can be collected in Azure Sentinel. So in Azure Sentinel, you have the, the data over here. And you can, uh, let's see if you have the connectors. In the connectors, they currently have the, the Azure IoT. The, Azure, 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 Azure Security Center for IoT. And that collects all the alerts into uh, Sentinel. So, and back to the query. So you can go to the security alerts and then you can uh, search for Azure Security Center for IoT. And over here you have the fun stuff, the the double pulsar, the not petias, but also the good thing is if you have a PLC uh, which is uh, being scanned or under attack and it goes down, you get also an alert uh, from CyberX which displays uh, that a PLC is not responding anymore. Maybe it comes back with an APIPA IP address and also other alerts like uh, the custom alerts, they will eventually land in here. And then you can, uh, with your uh, playbooks, you can trigger automation. Right. So it's not only detecting, but then through uh, the playbooks, you could really also start responding to some of these things. Yeah. And you can also do like API calls. So then you can also trigger, uh, for instance, uh, closure of ports of IP addresses uh, of VLANs, uh, maybe disable certain firewall rules. And, uh, yeah, make sure you respond yeah. well and uh, and make response a, a key measure to what's happening. Yeah, wonderful. Well, thank you for the live demo, uh, Johnny. Um, Maurice, um, I'm betting there's more questions at this point, or no? Yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> this is a question from uh, Bas Wassenaar. Um, he asked, this is a question about learning paths. Uh, what do you think about the general level of knowledge about uh, IT, OT, security of companies with these uh, these type of environments? So are there any learning paths, courses for people to improve themselves? Yeah, well, great uh, question, Bas, and uh, hello from uh, from the live stream. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the previous question you had on, on the general level of knowledge about IT and OT is a broad question. Uh, OT security seems to be a bit behind is what I'm hearing from the last hour. Uh, a lot of investments going into IT security is what we're seeing. The learning path is interesting because sometimes you see something from a vendor 
Um, maybe if you're working with Azure Defender for IoT, there's a wealth of information on those products. Uh, other products will have the same, uh, other vendors will have the same. Uh, but certainly the SANS Institute will have great essentials uh, on ICS uh, SCADA systems and, 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 and the Purdue model, for instance. Uh, you could look at GI, CSP, GRID. Uh, there's a ton of things uh, uh, what you could pursue. There are very specific trainings and certifications you can grab for OT. Uh, so I encourage you, for instance, to look at SANS and, uh, and see uh, all the trainings they have. They're highly recommended uh, for sure. Cool. Any, uh, any more, Maurice? Yeah. <laughs> there's another one from Puraf. Uh, he's really uh, going for the win, I guess. But it's a good question. It's a question about uh, how are uh, exceptions uh, handled within your security policy, I guess. Uh, if you don't want to, if you don't want a particular device uh, to be detected or accept a security risk uh, with a CVE, uh, how do you deal with that? Yeah, also a very good question. So what if you want to filter out the device or maybe make sure you don't start alerting on those? Um, Johnny, I think in general, if we're working with Azure Sentinel, if we're working with uh, Azure Defender for IT, uh, there are options, of course, I would say to filter, uh, no? Yes, uh, of course, and, uh, because uh, the alerting starts at Azure IoT, so you can uh, start your filtering over there. And also, uh, if you want your custom detections, and you can also create some filtering from the from the cyber solution itself. So there's a lot of places where you can uh, filter those. Okay, yeah, so, uh, so certainly options uh, for that uh, as well. Um, other questions? Yes, uh, this one is uh, from uh, Frans Vogt. Uh, can non-IP be monitored? Oh yeah, yeah. That's uh, that's a good question. Uh, are are we just looking at IP traffic, or uh, can we do uh, non-IP traffic? Um, I think in the screenshot you showed, Dima, is that uh, the sensors, the uh, they they listen at a low level, is it not? Yeah. So there's plenty of, uh, for instance. Uh, non-IP traffic that is very, very low latency, specifically designed for OT environments, and that uh, that can be monitored. And these these sensors, they're usually listening on uh, OZ model layer two, so that's mm. it's uh, it's implemented. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, we saw examples from TriStation, Siemens, uh, and whatnot. So listening at level two gives plenty of opportunity to look at all of these uh, these traffic models. Yeah, um, Maurice. Yeah, another question about uh, be uh, about uh, frameworks from uh, Beatrice Atubatele. Uh, are there or is there a framework that addresses IoT and OT? Yeah, very good question. I'm going to Johnny for this one. Are we seeing things from our favorite uh, uh, framework uh, uh, nonprofit organization? Definitely, you have from Maestro. I think you mean them. <laughs> you yes. have the, the framework for, uh, for uh, I think it's called the, the ICS uh, attack matrix. And that shows a really good representation of the all the attack factors and how you can reach them. So if you have those, then you also know uh, what you need to protect. I think that's yeah. a really good start. Yeah, yeah good point. I really think good. if people go to mitra.org, they can find the attack framework for ICS. And uh, you get the same framework as you see, for instance, for uh, for some of these others. Uh, but there are different tactics for ICS, SCADA, and OT. You see things like impair process control, uh, inhibit response function, uh, things you need to worry about in an OT environment. So going to mitra.org, uh, learning about a tech for ICS is certainly a good way to uh, get some uh, uh, understanding of the to, uh, tools, techniques, and procedures that uh, adversaries could use uh, in an industrial environment. Yes, and also um, the good thing is that you have a lot of these uh, tactics are already covered uh, with the CyberX solution. Yeah, 
Very good point. And I think uh, also if you look in Azure Sentinel, we see a lot of these tactics uh, available to you, for instance, in alert rules and other places. Yeah. Uh, Maurice. Yeah, Beatrice has another question. So uh, she asked, or he, uh, is there any freely available IoT data set? Oh yeah, uh, so so maybe also to uh, to do some testing uh, with. Um, I know, and I, I'm looking at Johnny for this one as well. Uh, there are PCAPs on the internet, uh, is it not? Yes, there are uh, several uh, PCAPs. Uh, the team from Nozomi, it's also a vendor for this kind of solution, uh, created a PCAP from Triton. And there's also uh, there are some uh, PCAPs related to uh, DEF CON events. Uh, I think the, the ICS Village uh, put up some uh, PCAPs. And there are also some universities uh, who are sharing their PCAPs on their uh, simulations. Oh, yeah. Yeah, good point. Yeah. All right. Well, the, the, the questions keep rolling in. Wonderful. Uh, Maurice, uh, Let's continue. Yeah, yeah. Of course. Uh, this one is from Pura again. Um, does Defender for IoT have any reporting capabilities? Any dashboards, etc.? Any reporting dashboards in Defender for IoT? Well, I think we saw it in the live demo earlier as well. Uh, there's a ton of things uh, in the web interface uh, journey. Uh, we saw custom reports, out-of-box reports, some of the dashboards with uh, uh, the Purdue model uh, and some of the graphical views, and they extend all the way into Azure Sentinel, uh, right? Yes, they uh, extend into Sentinel and also uh, uh, you have the, from the sensors, you also have like a management appliance which you can connect all the sensors together. Or you can order it on prem or in the Azure cloud, or you can do a hybrid approach. And it's, uh, if I can share my screen, then we can, uh, I can show a bit more. Great. Yeah, over here. Because you have, uh, depending on what you want, you have, of course, the timeline uh, with the events. And you see uh, when a device was connected. So that's a basic uh, thing you would like to know. You have the, 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 the risk assessments. You can uh, generate a report on your uh, environment. And uh, what was it in the data mining? You can. Uh, generate small reports also on the on the estate and of course you can uh, forward uh, to the several uh, options you can uh, forward it by email by Plunk, ArcSight, uh, you have all these options to uh, send your data into your uh, your management solution also if you want to uh, send something to your power or firewalls that you can uh, uh, block ports over there, same with uh, the forty gates. So uh, yeah, you have a ton of options over here. Okay, yeah. No, that's uh, that's something that's out of the box. Yeah, great, uh, Maurice. Uh, how are we doing with the questions? Yeah, we are finalizing uh, the questions. Um, I think it's a bit uh, done now. There's an, uh, there's just one question uh, about uh, a breach. Um, during a breach, are incident response procedures similar to uh, OT security? Mm, the incident response procedures. Uh, Dima, is that something you can comment on? <coughs> yeah, sure. Um, since many of the OT is also like normal IT based, like Windows based, I think many normal incident response procedures apply, like preparation, containment, uh, eradication, recovering, and learning. Uh, these procedures all apply. Uh, but what is different with industrial control systems or OT is that production continuity is important. So uptime is important, and uptime should continue. So production should be brought back up, and this in, in more disconnected mode, this could lead to a little bit of extra uh, overhead for engineers that are on site. Um, 
but to gain control over the situations, uh, OT environments have a nice extra card at hand, island mode. So by disconnecting IT from OT and going fully air gapped, uh, additional attacker activity can be prevented, while production can usually continue without IT, possibly even at full speed. So, but only like one thing though is that some of these services uh, that are like used from IT or, or DMZ land should have a primary counterpart that remains accessible. So, for instance, MTP. If none of the OT machines can reach the NTP servers, then it's possible that the PLC clocks uh, and the clocks of other embedded devices would slowly drift away from, for instance, computers. And this clock drift can accumulate over a span of a week and can cause OT protocol communications to drop after a while because then the times aren't synchronized anymore. And this loss of control is dangerous and can easily lead to downtime. So that is one of the things that should uh, preferably be prepared in f in beforehand. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But otherwise, so many... mostly a lot of the same things as well. Yeah. Yeah. Many the same, but different. That uh, production continuity and uptime should uh, continue. Yeah, it makes total sense in such an important environment. Uh, now to close off, Dima, uh, you are a specialist in this field uh, at Outflank. Uh, shout out to all the great folks at Outflank. Uh, you often come into contact with OT environments. Like you said, you uh, traveled quite a bit and saw a number of sites um, and you saw their security or lack of. What tips would you have for companies uh, with this respect? Yeah, uh, good question, broad question. Um, well, I'm always a big fan of network filtering. Like if you cannot reach it, you cannot hack it, uh, I, I'd say. like. Network uh, firewalling and network filtering helps even if, for instance, a service is vulnerable and cannot be patched, or even if you have valid privileged credentials on the remote machine. Like, uh, I, I think network filtering always forces an attacker to retry or to try something different. And so to basically become more noisy, which in turn can be monitored for. Um, Another thing that is closely related here is like uh, allowing administrative ports like RDP, SMB, what, et cetera, only from administrative networks. Uh, and that's a powerful measure as well. And this uh, prevents a credential reuse or credential theft. Uh, for instance, what you saw in the Triton attack. Also, I'm looking forward to sites to implement modern IT dev uh, or, or IT like dev, DevOps techniques. So for instance, virtualization, um, it can be used to spin up redundant machines, which is improving availability and redundancy can be used to test changes, uh, patches and all these kind of things and improving availability. Redundancy also allows for rotations of machines decreasing the lifetime of a machine and the impact, for instance, of Mimikatz by having a shorter time to live. And imagine that if, if all the machines are read only that you can create or that you create, then Im imagine that all Windows systems in the OT being virtual and the ransomware breaks out. So what you do is you restart all the virtual machines and all the ransomware is gone. Pretty, pretty nice. So this impacts opportunities for persistency and for, for like making impact, especially quick ransomware attacks. Um, and lastly, I'd like to see that OT includes like the, the regular uh, IT security concepts on their roadmap, like concepts such as the Microsoft tiered administration model is a strong countermeasure and the clean source principle. And that one is especially nice going, for instance, from IT to OT, like something like this. Wow, those are great tips and uh, wonderful quote. If you cannot reach it, you can't hack it. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's it's been great. A lot of tips. Um, 
going back to Maurice, uh, are we getting more questions? Are we at uh, at the top of the list now? Uh, all the questions are dried up right now. Uh, yes. So, all right. Uh, well, I think then it's time to start declaring a winner, no? Yeah, yeah. I will announce the winner uh, for my Minecraft Dungeon shortly. But first, I want to ask uh, if you are watching the recording of the show, uh, let me remind you, if you have a question, you can still send it in using hashtag ask for tell on Twitter or find us on LinkedIn and get in touch because uh, yeah, we like to share our knowledge with the community. And uh, then for the winner, um, today's winner of uh, the, uh, uh, what was it? Minecraft Dungeons uh, will go to Purav. Uh, Purav, please send us uh, an email. Uh, to uh, werken at bortel.nl or send us a message at Twitter uh, so we can make sure uh, you will get your prize. Um, yeah, well, I think that's it. Uh, oh, yeah. And people, if you are watching the recording, please like this video. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great suggestions and congratulations to Purov. Uh, thanks everybody else for asking questions. Uh, Beatrice, Franz, uh, Coase, all the people I forgot, Lars uh, and anybody else. Thank you again for engaging with, uh, with us. This is what we love to do and, and that's great. Uh, also thanks of course to Emil, uh, to Gianni, uh, Dima, uh, Nick, Thomas and of course Maurice uh, for doing the questions. Uh, we had so much fun making this. I also want to shout out uh, to Jeroen, uh, to Friso, to Chantal and all of the great people behind the scenes that you're not seeing now. Oh. Uh, these have been, uh, this, it has been a pleasure. Um, it's the last episode for this year. We'll be coming back next year, of course, with more new live streams. Uh, like Maurice said, subscribe to our channel, give us a thumbs up and uh, we hope to see you soon. So thank you and uh, until the next time.